Just over two weeks ago, we remembered the 16th anniversary of the September 11th attacks, the largest terrorist attack in modern history. This horrific, violent, incident of violent extremism changed the way that we see the world and influenced many to start to think how they might counter the threat of terrorism. But for me, however, the incident that led me down the path of analyzing terrorism and violent extremism began over 30 years ago in Germany. I grew up as a military brat, meaning my father was a member of the US military. And I spent my entire high school years living in a small German village to the east of Frankfurt. I loved my days in Germany. But what gripped me as a teen was the attacks of the terrorist group, the Red Army Faction, also known as the Bader Meinhof Gang. On an August night in 1985, a young American soldier visited a nightclub in Wiesbaden. He met a cute German girl and walked her home later that night. What this young soldier didn't realize was that she was a terrorist. He was shot in the head, his body was dumped in the woods, and uh, just so that the, the, the terrorist organization could get access with, to his military ID card. With that ID card, another terrorist entered the Rhein-Main Air Force Base the next day in a stolen US vehicle that was laden with 500 pounds of explosives. When the car exploded, two people were killed, 11 injured, and dozens of, of vehicles and, and buildings were damaged. That, that was a very memorable experience for me, and a, an attack that changed my life. It really made me start to think, what can I do to stop this? Why do people actually spend so much time pursuing violent extremism that they would want to kill innocent people? And it's led me on a lifelong journey to counterterrorism. Now, terrorism is a phenomenon that continues to grip our world and it seems to be ever increasing. My birth in 1968 happens to coincide with uh, the beginning of the modern era of terrorism. My mother actually would agree with this. Um, back then there was, only and, uh, there was only 98 acts of terrorism and about 197 people uh, or casualties. The year of 1992 was the first high point in the modern era of terrorism with over 4,000 attacks and 20,000 casualties. This was also the first year of marriage for my wife and I. Um, she was trying to encourage me to become a pharmacist like her father because she really felt that there was no future in terrorism. And she was right in part because there was a decline in terrorism. But in 2014, we saw a rise. Actually, started, the rise started at the beginning of the new millennium. And in 2014, we saw 14,000 terrorist attacks with almost 85,000 casualties. Now, since then, we've seen a small decline, but terrorism clearly has not faded away. Now, terrorism, while perhaps the most mentioned manifestation of violent extremism, is not the sole appearance that we see today. Expressions of violent ex um, extremism can be seen in the desecration of what we might see as holy such as Jewish cemeteries or statues of, of Buddha, all the way to genocide of people such as in Rwanda. Just last month, we experienced and witnessed extremism as white supremacists, Ku Klux Klan members, and neo-Nazis rallied in Charlottesville to, to attempt to preserve Confederate monuments there. One on their side took a further extreme action in driving through the crowd of counter-protesters, killing a woman, and injuring others. Violence, however, again, is just one manifestation of the peril of extremism, but surely not the only one. But before I discuss more about the perils of extremism, I'd like to talk about what extremism actually is and how one becomes an extremist. Extremism is to go far beyond mainstream thought, beliefs, and actions. It's to take a position of, or belief to such an extreme as to ignore the consequences of such a view and to view others with contrary positions and beliefs with intolerance. We can see examples of extreme beliefs, obviously in politics, but also in religion, sports, science, medicine, virtually all aspects of life. In statistics, we often look at the normal curve to show a population's position from the mean. 
The standard deviation is used to measure the spread from the mean. And we know that 95% of a population will be within two standard deviations from the mean. In terms of extremism, those I'm most concerned about are those that find themselves two or more extremes uh, or standard deviations from the mean. Of course, the further one gets from the mean, the more extreme that individual is. So what leads someone to become an extremist? I don't think anyone wakes up one morning and says, I think I'll be an extremist. Instead, the journey to extremism is a gradual step-by-step -step process towards the fringe. First, the individual becomes interested in a topic. His mind is intrigued by something of perceived value. This might be someone new to a religion or energized for a political cause. In this first step, there is absolutely nothing wrong, since engagement is something that we as educators and students will hope for in our classrooms. Yet, the individual in a continuing thirst for knowledge joins others with similar interest. And the discussions, instead of looking at all sides of the topic, focus on just one side of the issue. This single-sided discussion works to reinforce existing views and leads them ever steadily towards the extreme. The group isolates itself from others intellectually as well as physically and continues step by step to take each other away from the mainstream views. As counter-terrorist Mark Sageman describes this process for young radicals, he says, the interactivity among a bunch of guys acts as an echo chamber which progressively radicalizes them collectively to the point where they're ready to join a terrorist organization. I like Sachem's concept of the echo chamber, since this is what uh, terrorists and extremists do, isolate themselves so that they can only hear their own voices, uh, which only further strengthens and exacerbates their views. This process of becoming an extremist works the same way for terrorists as it does for other flavors of extremism with the exception that the others tend not to always lead towards violence. I would like to share a, an, an example with you that I hope doesn't offend too many of you. A young mother might be worried about this decision whether or not to vaccinate her child. She has heard sides of the story on both sides of the story on social media. Vaccines can save lives, but others also that vaccines uh, are often held responsible by some for physical and mental changes in children. With her interest high in the topic, she presses forward looking at the evidence. However, she does not give both sides equal attention, but instead looks solely at all the negative sides on the internet. She follows those on social media who are outspoken against vaccination and joins the anti-vaxxers echo chamber, which carries her further away from common sense beliefs. She falls into the psychological trap of cognitive consistency, of downplaying scientific evidence that discounts her held beliefs and amplifying information that would support it. She then starts to vocalize her contempt for those mothers who would, in her mind, cruelly subject their children to the risk of vaccinations and treats those mothers with intolerance since they are absolutely <laughs> Sorry, uh, are, after all, heartless mothers. She has gone from being a mother with a genuine concern for her own precious child to someone on the extreme who criticizes known science and subjects her own children and the children around them to, to disease. She is obviously not a terrorist, but she is an extremist. If I, as I have just shown, extremists are not all violent, nor are they all political in nature. We all have the capacity, if we allow it, to slowly slide into extremism. Even in our church, we can become extreme in nature if we focus solely on one aspect at the expense of others. There is nothing wrong, for example, with family history, but if that becomes one's only thought and passion, it can also eventually lead an individual in an extreme path. I like President Boyd K. Packer's analogy of a piano to make this point. He said, how short-sighted it is then to choose a single key and endlessly tap out a monotony of a single note, or even two or three notes, when the full keyboard of limitless harmony can be played. I think we all know someone who's attempting to play their own personal symphony with just one key. So now that I've covered how someone may slowly enter the ranks of extremism, what are the perils of extremism? 
Let me say that I will not discuss all the potential dangers of extremism, but rather I will share with you those that are of concern to me. While each flavor of extremism might hold unique perils, I want to focus on those dangers that I believe hold across the spectrum of extreme viewpoints. We know that extremism can, but does not always lead to violence. Violence, however, is the peril of extremism that led me in my personal, uh, professional pursuits on how to counter terrorism. Yet, I will not discuss violence as the only peril of extremism, since I believe other dangers of extremism are also harmful to individuals and societies. First, I think one of the perils of extremism is isolation. Those that move towards the fringe become isolated from society, isolated from friends and families, and potentially isolate themselves from God. This isolation hurts both directions. Extremists lose contact with those who love them and find acceptance in new friends who share their views. They lose the desire to connect with the outside world since the outside does not believe as they do. Similarly, the outside starts to lose the desire to connect with them since the extremists are fixated only on their fringe topic. Sadly, I've unfriended individuals uh, from Facebook that I believe were extremists. Um, <clears throat> just to clarify, um, these are not those that have contrary opinions to me. I welcome those friends. Rather, I've, unfri I've unfriended those that are so far removed from the mainstream that they no longer recognize their own intolerance. This isolation is indeed a peril for friendship, for families, and for societies. We are, also, we are so always stronger when we are together, especially with our diversity. And I worry most about individuals whose decision to focus solely on extreme views, including doctrine, walk away from God, feeling that their views are more important than his views, or their cherished single doctrine is more important than the simplicity and beauty of the entire gospel. Second, I'm concerned about the peril that extremism has in ending constructive, crit uh, constructive conversation. Even if we are not extremists but are simply moving further away from each other, we lose the ability to talk rationally with those on the other side. As a political scientist, this worries me greatly. The great strength of a democracy is its ability to engage in civil discourse with one another. Yet when we start to demonize the other side, we no longer have the desire to spend time with one another. Here in the United States, we've created a divide between Democrats and Republicans, not necessarily between the politics of the two sides, but often between who we perceive each other to be. One of my uh, favorite types of humorous political videos is when a reporter uh, interviews a political party member, either side, it doesn't matter which, and asks for opinion of a purported policy supported by their, pol um, their party's leader. Only the policy that is suggested is actually the policy from the opposing political side. The interviewed individual quickly praised the policy or derided if it was suggested it came from the other side. This falls under the logical fallacy of guilt by association. We quickly demonize the policies originating from our political opponents without judging the merit of the policy itself. How can we have meaningful political conversation when we instantly demonize our opponents? Are our leaders on our side of the political spectrum really saints, while the others are the spawn of Satan? No, no they're not. The strength of democracies is the ability to foster political debate, not debate in the negative term um, of shouting at each other, but rather the chance to put forward various views and seek through rational discourse to find the best way forward. When we lose the ability to talk with one another in a rational, civil manner, we start to lose civilization itself. Another peril of extremism um, as groups polarize is the phenomenon of groupthink. This is a concept put forward by the, psycholo uh, by the psychologist Irving Janus. As explained by Cass Sunstein, quote, Janus suggested that there was a certain groups, um, was that certain groups stifle dissent, value consensus over correctness, fail to examine alternatives and consequences, and as a result, end up producing fiascos, end quote. Now, when Janus spoke of fiascos, he meant taking greater risks. 
um, which politically has led to some really bad decisions. Consider the Bay of Pigs during the Kennedy administration as an off-sided example. However, taking greater, greater risk can also lead to deadly consequences as well. Now, groupthink is not something foreign to many of us. All of our mothers have warned us as teens, would you jump off a cliff if your, all your friends were doing it? Unfortunately, uh, the simple answer to this is yes, many of us would do it. This is easily seen in terrorist groups. As the group isolates themselves, they only hear opinions from each other. They also have the desire to agree with each other since they don't want to be seen as the weak link in the terrorist organization, or they might even fear the terrorist leader. Their extremist views mixed with peer pressure lead them to take risks. It is risky to build a bomb, to engage in a shootout with police or hijack planes and crash them into buildings. Thus, extremism mixed with a desire to conform in a group leads to riskier behavior, whether you're a terrorist or just an extremist. Riskier behavior than we would see by just an individual by themselves. Extremists see the world in black and white, wrong and right. They, of course, are right, while the rest of us are all wrong. This in itself is a peril, but it can also lead to dehumanizing, whereby those that are wrong are seen as less than human. If they are indeed wrong, then they cannot be as intelligent or in a civilized as we are. If religion is part of the extremism, then God favors us and cannot tolerate them. Demon uh, Dehumanization has been the process for millennia to make it easier to commit acts of violence against one's opponents, since they are not fully human. While we in this room might feel that we are not, uh, that we won't fall into this trap, let me try and offend even more of you. <laughs> there are those here and throughout the Wasatch Front that are fans of the University of Utah, and those that are fans of BYU in Provo. Sporting can bring out healthy competition, but it can also bring out extremism too. We have all heard many jokes about each side of the rivalry, right? But I'm sure that many of us have also heard both sides demonize the fan base of both sides. This process of dehumanizing our rivals makes it difficult to deal with each other on a day-to-day -day basis, to take one another serious at work and in social settings, and lead us to ostracizing whole groups of people just on the basis of college selection. One group are not devil worshipers and the others are not religious zealots. However, both sides do have extremists. Now this was just a harmless example, but what happens when extremist views become popular opinion? One of the greatest perils of extremism is when extremism becomes the mainstream. When a society moves to the extreme, there is such a greater chance for violence or strife amongst its people. It can be hard to imagine how the mainstream might even contemplate moving to the extreme. In fact, most members of a society, if asked, would ridicule the idea that someday that they would willingly espouse radical or extremist views. I think Alexander Pope's simple poem best describes the movement of an individual or a society to the extreme. He said, Vice is a monster of so frightful mien, as to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too oft, familiar with her face, first we endure, then pity, then embrace. Exposure to extreme beliefs without check can gradually move us ever so slowly in an extreme direction. I think this can best be seen with the example of post-World War I Germany. Germany was frustrated after the end of the Great War. The German citizens had no idea that, they were, that their country was even losing the war, so that when the war came to an abrupt end, they were confused and indeed humiliated. To make matters worse, the Treaty of Versailles required reparations from the defeated Germany, which created a massive economic hardship for that country. Soon the German economy was suffering from hyperinflation, which impoverished the middle class. Just as things started to improve, the German economy was caught up in the international ripples of the American Great Depression. The German people felt lost and desperately sought for answers to their political and economic conditions. Some Germans indeed turned to the radical left for answers embracing communism, 
while others turned to the extreme right, clinging to the Nazi party. The majority, however, remained at first between these two extreme movements. Yet how did so many people start to turn to the Nazi party and to the Nazi beliefs? Simple, they started to listen to the lies propagated by the Nazi party without dismiss dismissing them for the utter fabrications that they were. In times of uncertainty, it is nice to find someone to blame for our misfortunes. The Nazis used the Jews as their country's scapegoat. Here we see examples of Nazi propaganda, stories used to create distrust and hatred for the Jews. The first shows a Jewish stock market trader uh, sitting on the top of a giant bag of money. The caption beneath it um, states that, uh, that, well, it says in German, I'll, I'll read it for you, but it says that, the, the tr uh, that money is the true Jewish God. In a time of economic hardship, the belief that Jews were benefiting economically while the rest of the population barely eked out a living bred contempt. The second shows a Jew using candy to lure innocent German children into his home in order to indulge in his evil designs. Fortunately for sweet little Elsa, her brother Hans recognizes the man as a Jew, stops her from taking the candy and calls a nearby policeman who takes the Jew into custody. The children's mother in this propaganda story later warns, a devil goes throughout the land, the Jew he is, known to us all as murder of children of peoples and polluter of the races, the terror of children in every country. He wants to ruin the youth. He wants all people to die, have nothing to do with the Jew, and you'll be happy and gay. Little by little, these lies were accepted by the people. What once was seen as abominable became commonplace. In time, millions came to espouse Nazi beliefs and to create a cult of worship around Hitler. We now look at history and view the disturbing reality of the Holocaust and question how? How could so many people become so extreme? Hannah Arendt's title of her book, Banality of Evil, sums up the answer for Adolf Eichmann, a Nazi leader, as well as for millions of German people, that extremist actions just became normal. And once extremism becomes normal, extensive violence is just a step away. So some of the potential perils of extremism I've discussed are isolation, end of constructive um, conversation, risky behavior brought about by groupthink, and the dehumanization of the other side, and increased violence when extremism becomes mainstream. If these are the pa perils we would encounter because of extremism, what can we do to avoid allowing ourselves or our communities to become extreme? While it may seem logical, that moderation is the answer to extremism, it is not. Certainly there is nothing wrong with taking a moderate stand in life at times, but there's also nothing wrong with having divergent views as well. If we look back at the normal curve, we can see that the majority are in the middle, but that doesn't mean they are all of one opinion. While the vanilla might be the most accepted flavor of ice cream, it's not my favorite, and I would hate to live in a world with no other option than vanilla ice cream for dessert. Being moderate in all things can also lead, as Elder Dallin H. Oaks points out, to justifying moderation in commitment. Moderation can lead to being lukewarm or passive. Instead of being moderate or encouraging everyone to be middle of the road, we need instead to be humble. We need to look inward and try to recognize if we are heading down the path of extremism. As Socrates has reminded us, the unexamined life is not worth living. Are we focusing on just one facet of our life, our discipline, our belief, without seeing the bigger picture, or hearing alternate perspectives than just our own? I think first and foremost thing that we can do is step out of the echo chamber. When we only indulge our minds in information that we already confirms our own viewpoints, we continue to become more and more entrenched in our own views and risk the slide further into extreme. Unfortunately for American politics, too many of our citizens fall into this trap. In decades past, when viewers wished to become informed, they turned on network television with rather bland, neutral news broadcasters. However, with the creation of cable, the 24-7 news channels entered the scene and offered up an endless stream of news in the political flavor of choice. 
political conservative sup from, political and conser or from politically conservative commentators, while political liberals feed from liberal commentators, which further reconfirms their own political views. Social media and the internet have only exacerbated this issue. Too many people spend most of their time basking in the echo chamber of choice, hearing the things they already believe and discounting or not even listening to and hearing those things that might challenge their viewpoints. If we wish to avoid the peril of extremism, we need to end this echo chamber practice. We need to choose to listen to a multitude of perspectives and use our own minds to make our own decisions. President George Washington is a good example of striving to avoid the echo chamber, uh, the echo chamber trap. He brought uh, diverging opinions into his first cabinet. Thomas Jefferson, the first Secretary of State, Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury. These two members of President Washington's inner circle gave vastly differing uh, views in the direction that the new country should take. The role of advisors, counselors, and board members is not to rubber stamp a leader's decisions or views, but rather to give honest counsel so that the decision at the end is based on sound judgment. This is virtually impossible within an echo chamber. So get out, talk with uh, other people with differing views and ideas. Listen to a variety of credible sources of information with varying opinions on the topics you study so that you can make better decisions for yourself rather than just being led down the path by fellow believers, slipping further and further towards extremism. After we've decided to think for ourselves and leave the echo chamber behind, we need to have the courage to speak up. I think one of the greatest quotes on this topic also comes out of the context of Nazi Germany. Martin Niemöller was a Lutheran pastor who spent seven years in a Nazi concentration camp because he spoke out against Adolf Hitler. After his release, Niemöller felt that he could have done so much more for the plight of the Jews. He said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. When no one is willing to speak out against extremist views, we give power and acceptance to those fringe or intolerant beliefs. Speaking up can be difficult, but it is the right thing to do. I remember a simple experience that I had a dozen years ago on a flight from Washington, D.C. to Dallas. A young mother was sitting two rows behind me uh, with a baby who was probably congested. Since as soon as the plane started to climb, that baby began to cry in pain. The baby's crying continued throughout the flight, the whole flight. And just as the baby started to settle down, our plane started to descend into Dallas and the baby started to cry in pain once again. By the time we were on the ground, everyone was ready to get off the plane. However, as we stood up, waiting for the door to open and to disembark, an older man, I was gonna call him a gentleman, but he wasn't, started an intolerant diatribe at the young mother. I will spare the audience some of his colorful language. But he basically said, lady, get that baby to stop crying. We are all sick and tired of your inability to mother your child. I was shocked that someone would say something like this to a young mother, or any mother. And what shocked me even more was the silence, other than the baby's crying, in the plane as nobody said a word. I took a deep breath and uh, some courage, and I said, I'm sorry, but that was an extremely rude comment. Not everyone feels that way. And as soon as I said that comment, the mood in the whole plane just changed. People started saying, hey, leave her alone, or what's your problem, man? Then with the silence broken, people started to look and to, to turn towards the mother to help her gather her things. The old man continued to, to offer his rude insights on her lack of mothering skills, but the mood had definitely changed. Many of us stopped listening to him and turned our focus on her. While this might not be a political example of countering extremism, I feel it shows the need to stand up at all times and in all places to protect the innocent, to ensure, as a friend of mine once said, that truth does not suffer. So if we have the courage to speak up, we also need to have the courage to act. Now, I'm not advocating that we all need to 
pick up signs and go become protesters, all some of us may and do choose to, to take that step. Rather, I'm suggesting that we take an active step in the direction away from extremism. Speaking up may at times be the only action needed or that we are capable of taking, but there are times when we need to be engaged in a good cause. In fact, in the face of intolerance towards refugees around the world, I'm so grateful that our church has created the I Was a Stranger campaign. What does it suggest for members to do to act against hatred? Make a new friend, become informed of the needs in the local community, or volunteer at a low income clinic or a, a local nonprofit organization. A family friend in Germany is acting by helping to teach German to newly arrived refugees in that country. While we may not have refugees here in Laie, we can help those less fortunate in a similar fashion. Speaking up and acting are vital, but we also need to learn humility and tolerance. Humility and realizing that we might not always be right, which can be very hard for many of us faculty, or that our views are not in fact the one and only true way forward. Tolerance and respect of other people and opinions is essential as well, um, essential as well. President Gordon B. Hinckley has said, I plead with our people everywhere to live with respect and appreciation for those not of our faith. There's so great a need for civility and mutual respect among those of differing beliefs and philosophies. We must not be partisan of any doctrine of ethnic superiority. We live in a world of diversity. We can and must be respectful towards those with whose teachings we may not agree. We must be willing to defend the rights of those who may become the victims of bigotry. Tolerance is essential in the fight against uh, extremism. However, the pendulum can swing in the opposite direction as well. An extreme level of tolerance can also lead us to moral relativism, believing that all paths are true and that we should respect everything. This is a peril in and of itself. Unlimited tolerance can also lead us to what the philosopher Karl Popper called the paradox of tolerance. He said, Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. We should therefore claim in the name of tolerance the right not to tolerate the intolerant. I think President Hinckley's words echo Popper's. He said, may the Lord bless us to work unitedly to remove from our hearts and drive from our society all elements of hatred, bigotry, racism, and other decisive words and actions. The snide remark, the racial slur, hateful epithets, malicious gossip, and mean and malicious rumor mongering should have no place among us. We need to ensure that we are kind and tolerant, but also need to, to let the intolerant know that we will not tolerate their intolerance. This does not mean that we must protest, but it does mean that we need to not let intolerance breed within our own lives, our homes, our societies, unchecked. This is a grassroots effort and not something that will be solved up at the top. I am grateful that students and faculty from BYU, Hawaii, helped to counter extremism by working with the organization Peace Players International, which brings Palestinian and Israeli youth together to play basketball, not as two separate opposing teams, but integrated teammates. This is a fantastic example of what is needed, but we need to do more. Each of us needs to look inside ourselves and honestly and humbly recognize those tendencies that might take us to the fringe. Then we need to reach out to the victims of extremism, speak out when necessary, and act in tolerance and love to all those around us. The peril of extremism or something that will be with us for a long, long time, but we need not condone or ignore them, but rather actively strive to stand up against them. As we prepare to send out students from BYU Hawaii with training in the arts, sciences, social science, business, or whatever fields, we need to help prepare them to avoid the perils of extremism in their own lives. We also need to teach them to get out of the echo chamber, to speak up, to act, 
to live with humility and tolerance, then they will be genuine gold and work towards the establishment of peace internationally. Thank you.